Hi guys. Back, I'm going to start talking about the uh, circuitry and the TV a little more closer and uh, at basically a request to talk about IF and uh, the mixer and primarily why we even have an IF. So, <clears throat> First and foremost, before we actually get into the TV, let's talk about why we need an IF and what the purpose of it is, uh, why it was invented. Uh, super heterodyne is basically what you're looking at. And you have to go back before TV uh, to the old radios, the TRF radios, tune radio frequency sets. You've seen, you know, I did some videos on them. I, I've got some. I showed you some of them operating and working on them and stuff. These are the sets from the 20s, primarily. Uh, there were some companies that were hold out uh, that went into the very early 30s, like 30, 31, somewhere in there. But in any case, on a TRF radio uh, receiver, you basically all you're doing is you've got several stages of amplifier and you're tuning each one to the radio frequency that you're trying to pick up now the whole reason for amplification is uh, if you don't amplify then you're not going to hear anything out of a speaker uh, you can build a crystal radio which has zero amplification you basically detect you tune in you got a tuner that you're tuning in a radio frequency with a large coil and a small capacitor and then you got a crystal detector in other words a germanium transistor and for your detector but you have to use earphones or headphones and to pick up any uh, to hear any signal and it's it can be quite weak unless the radio station that you're tuned into is pretty darn close and pretty strong that's not really all that good for generalized radio or TV. You know, people like to kind of sit in their easy chair and, and listen to it, and everybody in the household listen. We're not going to have everybody with headphones on. So, we had to amplify that signal. Well, early on, the, the way to do that was just build amplifiers, and we had to tune those amplifiers so you'd get the TR, uh, w radio, the TRF radio, the tuned radio frequency radio so you'd have you know uh, early on they were pretty simple one or two amps later we started getting two three four five amplifications in there but each each amplifier has to be tuned to the radio frequency and on it the big problem with that is you're asking an amplifier to cover a large ground of frequencies the entire broadcast band and you know, you might be able to build the amp to handle, uh, say, the upper band really well, amplify it really well with good strong uh, gain. But when you get to the lower band, it's it the gain drops off, or maybe it's at the lower. You know, you redesign it, and at the lower end of the band, it's really strong, a lot of gain. But when you get to the upper band, it drops off. Uh, most of them were designed where the mid band was the strongest and then they didn't drop off as much to the upper or lower end of the band, but you're still having this loss and gain because you're trying to build an amp and tune it and across a large range of frequencies. So something better had to be made. And that's where Super Heterodyne comes in place. Uh, the idea was then was we need to build an amplifier uh, our amplification section build a radio or TV you know later TVs had this but that we are only amplifying one single frequency for our main amplification we don't have to worry about different frequencies or, or different you know going clear across the band it, it only looks at one frequency and we can tune it and fine-tune it and make it work the best at that one frequency so we have the maximum gain. 
that's your IF. So how do you do that? Well, it's real simple. You bring in, your, you tune in your radio frequency. You still have a, a, a tuned radio frequency circuit, okay? You know, on a radio, just a, a capacitor that's across the antenna coil, making a tank circuit that resonates so that it resonates at the right frequency wherever you tune it. If there's a radio station there, it allows it through. Everything else gets blocked. You feed that into a tube called a mixer or converter or translator or first detector. There's a lot of different names for them, but it basically mixes signals. You have a local oscillator on board on the radio or TV, and that also is tunable and it will be connected by a separate tuning device you know, like in radio would be a capacitor on you know another section on the gain capacitor that you tune the local oscillator will be always at a frequency above the radio station frequency and the difference between those two will be worked out to be your IF frequency so what happens is you tune in a radio station, that signal comes into one grid on the mixer tube, and then you've got the local oscillator, which is tuned to the IF frequency above that radio station. So, you know, if it was 455 kil, kil cycles like more modern day radios, well then it'd be tuned 455 kil cycles above the radio station. The two signals go into the mixer, they get mixed. And I've talked about this before, there's four primary signals that comes out of the, out of the mixer. One is the radio station, untouched, unbothered, that frequency comes out. The local oscillator frequency comes out, unbothered, not mixed with anything. Then you have the two added together, and then you have the difference. Along with that, you're going to get a whole bunch of harmonic frequencies also as well but this all this goes in to an IF can inter, intermediate frequency can and in there is a transformer that is tuned it's a tank circuit got a capacitor and a coil on the primary side and it's got a secondary coil and a capacitor on the secondary side it's tuned to the IF frequency so it will only pass that IF frequency in a case like maybe you know 455 kilo cycles, it would be 160, it'd be 460, 475, it can be any number of frequencies just whatever it's designed for it's tuned to everything else gets blocked it doesn't go through it goes actually goes to ground and returns back and it feeds it through Get IF, and then that goes in the primary. Generally, these are one to one, so he just feeds right on, uh, coupled right onto the secondary through magnetic coupling, which is a tuned one, making darn sure that the IF frequency is the only thing that's getting there. And that goes into an amplifier tube, and we just amplify it. And that tube can work very efficiently because it's it only has to deal with and was designed in that circuit designed to only amplify that IF frequency and I can have several stages of amplification I, you know most radios that you'll run into has one or two but there are receivers expensive ones top dollar ones that had uh, several stages in fact they had what they call double conversion or even triple conversion where they would have start out with just the one converter we get one IF frequency we amplify it two or three stages maybe four at the most and then we actually have another local oscillator and another mixer tube and we convert it again and in other words mix it again and get a new IF frequency and then that will go through several stages of amplification and if it's really really an expensive radio it could go through a third uh, conversion where you have another oscillator tube and mixer tube and that one goes through and there's a whole new IF there that goes through several stages and then it gets detected. It's 
you know, those radios were expensive, but your average homeowner radio was, um, consumer radio had one or two amplifications. But the whole purpose of the IF is the fact that I have one single frequency, no matter where I tune the dial at, I have one frequency that I can do my master main amplification with. That way I can design my amplifiers so that they are efficient at that fr one frequency and that one frequency only. And that way I can get the maximum gain I can ever get out of a particular IF tube that I put in there for an amplifier. So I can work out all my uh, designs, all the, the parts and components and the wire links and everything. I can do all this design to match the maximum efficiency for the maximum gain of just that one frequency and I can have two three stages amplification or even four and get a really 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 strong signal going in the detector and then of course from there on to the audio section and and driving a good sized speaker and with good sound and being able to pick up a very weak radio station plus also I can have any number of bands and frequencies I want because that's all done up in the front end I don't have to worry. The IF can care less about that. All it cares about is it gets that one IF frequency. So that amplifier still is seeing the IF frequency and that's all it's got to amplify. It can care less whether you're on the broadcast band or you're on a, a, a shortwave band. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter if it's 1000 kilo cycles or 18 megahertz radio station you're picking up. It really don't care. So that's something that the TRF radios couldn't do. The, the best that they could do is broadcast band and not extraordinarily super well even at that uh, without several stages and, and a lot of shielding. Uh, they, the best they could do was just the broadcast band. If you wanted higher frequencies such as in the shortwave band there was no way they was ever going to be able to work with those. So another reason for having IF. I hope that answers the question why we have an IF. Um, now we're going to look at the tuner and this is going to be, uh, the video might be a little long, but it's going to be kind of quick through because I already talked about a lot of the information on both the tuner and the IF when I was comparing. So there's not a huge amount, but there are some things I want to point out and we'll be pointing out on this. And first of all, I want to pick out the components that's in here, the, the, the tubes and what they're doing. So right here you've got the antenna circuit. You know, so this this is right in this connection here will be or right around this area will be where you connect the antenna on the back of the TV set. Wires will run into the tuner. Now this little dotted line right here is one of those and I showed them before on the Admiral sets with their particular tuner they have a little uh, uh, well I'll just get one it's easier for you to see it than me trying to explain it and these little little sections that go in here. This first one is this one. It's the short one. And it's got uh, well just as it shows, it's got two coils on it. That's on here. The nice thing about these is they're pretty rugged. Uh, and when they're in the tuner they're locked into the drum so you know it you're not going to be bothering the coils if you're cleaning the tuner or doing any work with it and stuff it's only if you take these out and then even at that rate you'd have to do a little you know you'd have to really be thinking about it to do any serious damage um, coils you could but there are other type of tuners or wafer switch tuners kinda like you see a band switch in a radio 
you know, shortwave radio. They're just little uh, wafer switches. And that these coils would be out and open. Uh, nothing in. There are air coil, uh, air coil anyway. There's nothing inside here. It's just on a, a plastic form or cardboard tube form. But those coils and those type of tuners are just out and open. If you're really lucky and in some of the later sets that use that style, uh, some of them decided to put like a little sponge rubber like stuff inside the coil and once it was tuned and then put wax uh, embedded in wax, wax over the coil and the, and the sponge, which gave it some strength, but if you bumped it hard enough, you'd still move that coil. And if you, you know, change the distance between, focus, you know, you change this distance between these windings, you change how the coil reacts and, and the frequency it worked with. So, in those, you got to be, you know, cautious about those because the coils are out in the open, generally not on any type of form. And, you know, if you bump one or something, you may knock that fre knock it out of frequency. You can readjust it back in, but it, um, it can be kind of time-consuming. But anyway, this little section here is this piece right here. So, that's the two coils in this. This is channel 13, so um, I tried finding... I couldn't quickly find the same channels for the two sections. This section here in this dotted line is the other set of coils right here. And I think uh, this is a lower channel. It The marking is gone on it. I'm not sure what channel, but it's in the lower because of the size of the wire and the number of turns. But each one of these little coils represent these here. This one here that goes to the oscillator is the adjustable one and if you can yeah you can see it that's your adjustment. Now uh, case in point and warning about this and it's not like wow it's in the world you don't have to turn it very much if it is out of adjustment you know a quarter turn makes a world of difference but that little slug this little spring clip right here is what it threads into and that little slug is about a quarter inch long. That's all longer it is. They don't have because they they're not wanting to tune. They're not wanting to tune these. This is the coil that they're wanting to tune. So it they don't. It can't be very long. If you turn it in too far, if you turn it too far out and it falls out, that's not a big deal. But if you turn it in too far, it'll disengage this and fall down inside. And in a case like that, then what you want to do is lift this spring up gently and off to the side a little bit so it's not interfering. And you may have to tap it a few times to get that to drop down. And if everything's all right, this form has not been even the slightest bit damaged. Get in focus here. If it hasn't been damaged or anything, it will drop down plenty far enough that you can re-engage the spring and it's you're good to go. But unless someone's really messed with it, if you do a little work on the tuner or change the tube, the, especially the mixer oscillator tube, you'll probably have to adjust it a little bit, but it will not have to be that much. I say a quarter turn, just a quarter of a turn, makes a huge difference uh, on it. But anyway, this one here will be this coil here. The next one will be this one. They literally drew this out exactly. So this is the oscillator coil, bottom coil here. Center coil is this coil going to the mixer. This last coil is primary coming off the RF. Now, the way this thing works, signal comes in, gets coupled magnetically to the RF tube. This is RF amplifier, just a simple voltage amplifier. And now, if it was a radio, this would have a tuning condenser gang, antenna gang circuit, or gang to it. That you, you know, as you turn the condenser, tuning condenser, one of the gangs would be actually connected to the coil, antenna coil, and that would be this section right here. But since it's a TV and it is a clunker type, 
then what you're doing is each one of these for the uh, 213 has different windings on them to fit those frequencies. So that's what you're doing. You're putting in different coils in here that are different inductance. But anyway, the signal comes in, gets coupled, goes into the grid, and is amplified. That feeds out. This right here is the primary. It's going to feed into the secondary going to the mixer. This is the tuned section for the tuned RF. This coil here. This coil here will be the oscillator frequency coil. This is what tunes the oscillator to a particular frequency. For whatever channel you tune in, it will be running, its coil would be designed to make it run at the IF frequency above the signal coming in. Both these couple in magnetically to this coil here and feed into the mixer gets pretty much mixed. Actually a lot of the mixing action is happening here but really the primary will be happening in here and then that just feeds out and out of the tuner. Now on this we have the first IF uh, tuned circuit is right here so that's will be what blocks everything else and only allows which it's 23.1 megacycles in this case that's all it's going to allow through for for the most part. Now it is somewhat broadband so it will allow uh, certain other frequencies. We'll get into that in a minute. Now I was going to talk and am going to talk about some of the other stuff here. First of all nothing appears to be a tank circuit. Now I went ahead and drew out a little bit of an IF, uh, just one section of it of the IF and we're going to talk about where the tank circuit comes from and more in depth but the internal capacitance for one thing of the tubes you know the cathode to the grid the ca uh, to the first grid second grid third grid heck the cathode to the heater the plate to any one of these grids the grids to themselves and to the heater all this has a certain capacitance and if you actually look it out and draw it out you will find that you can actually bring that capacitance in parallel with the coil so you have a tank circuit as well as the wiring and any of these other capacitors are all part of the circuit capacitance. Now they're either adding into it such as if they're in parallel with the other capacitance or they're taking a little away if they're in series. But in any case they are part of that what is known total circuit capacitance which is actually across the coil to make up the tank circuit. It's just you don't see it on here because it's not necessary to draw it in. So it's there. Now we've got some trimmer caps here. This one here is trimming this circuitry here. That's what its job is. Is to trim this and get it in for alignment in a line. So it's trimming the antenna, basically the antenna circuit. This one here is trimming the tuned RF circuit. And its primary goal is this coil. But that's what it's for. Then we have this trimmer here, which works in conduction can, uh, with the fine tuning. You notice the fine tunings here. This one here, actually, center is basically centering the fine tuning because it, it's adjusting uh, the, the total capacitance of this circuit that's in the oscillator circuit. And you can think of it really as a fine tuning thing, although the book the, the, will say that. Uh, you know on the schematic or on the uh, service information and that if all your frequencies are off you know 2 through 13 instead of individually adjusting each one of these coils you could probably bring them all in if they're about the same amount off by just simply adjusting this but in reality you generally adjust this if your fine tuning is not really centered because it's just right in parallel with it the other adjustment for alignment is right here which is basically adjusting this coil uh, and getting it in a line uh, to go into the mixer. 
So this first one, antenna circuit, RF circuit, mixer circuit. Those are the three primary alignment adjustments that you make. As far as the rest of the caps, these are just, this is a decoupling cap to pull off any signal that gets on that, uh, that heater so it doesn't get back into the rest of the radio circuitry and cause problems. Plus they also went ahead and put a choke in here just to help out. They also got a choke in this one here. Again another decoupling cap. You know, Any signal gets on that heater because it is capacitive coupled to the cathode at a pretty good capacitance in a lot, as well as the rest of the elements in the tube. So, and you can get signal on this so you want to take that signal off and take it to ground and return it back. Uh, same way with the screen grid see this this you know we got our B, uh, B power supply voltage going to our screen we have screen voltage and just like any you know it's a standard tube so you supply a voltage to the screen well you got to have a decoupling cap because that screen is going to act somewhat like a plate as well. It's got B plus on it and it's going to pick up some signal that's going to affect it. You don't want that signal getting into your B plus. It, it gets in there um, on the screen and it gets into your power supply, goes to the other tubes, can cause problems. So that's what that guy's there for. Again, this is just a trimmer you will find that any number of tubes have you know the heaters have these decouplings if they got screen goods they have decouplings uh, we've got a cap here that is a coupling cap and then this decoupling here these two caps are actually working in unison with, as part of the uh, uh, fitted in for getting all the capacitance correct in this circuit now, sometimes you've got to add capacitance to get the tank circuit to work right because maybe you're not getting enough out of the tube or the local wiring or the uh, decouplings that you absolutely need like on your fill, uh, your heater circuit. So that's basically what this one's for. This one here along with the resistor is biasing. Um, it's a grid leak bias circuit. And grid leak always works with a capacitor. You have capacitor and resistor, and you use the time constant to get your bias correct. Um, the resistor will have will build up a voltage drop across it, which will um, basically all it does is charge up the capacitor. And it, and at some point, just a few cycles in, that capacitor gets to its full charge it needs to bias that grid properly for this circuit to work. Now, oscillators are generally class C, which means they only operate and conduct at a very short intervals of time. At, um, so, only when that, uh, there's enough positive voltage coming in on that grid to take it out of cutoff. And it's a very short period of time in the cycle. Then you get a little spurt out of the uh, plate. It conducts a little bit and kicks the oscillator tank circuit you know it's just like pushing a kid in a swing you don't keep continue pushing all the way through once you get the, get that child to where you want them at and the height and you want to just maintain them you just give a slight little push every time they come back well that's what's happening here we have just standard coupling cap going in uh, with a bias resistance here to bias the tube and then of course our trimmer and then we've got a decoupling on the outside here to pull off some signal there that pretty much takes care of it there's uh, your plate B, main B plus decoupling is here so the signal comes out of the out of here we have taken an antenna circuit signal fed it in from the antenna, tuned it by simply just switching channel selector tuned it, mixed it, we get our IF it comes through and feeds through some various filtering this is just your uh, 
first IF filtering circuit that feeds down and feeds into your first IF tube. Now it's no different than anything else in any IF. We amplify it, we filter it again, we amplify, filter it again, we amplify, filter, detector. Okay. In this particular set, like several different sets, there's there's various ways to uh, do your IF that they can do. This particular set is a very simple, limited, stagger tuned unit. It has two IF frequencies, 23.1 megacycles and 25.3, to uh, give you a stagger tuning and and to get that. Um, the broadband response that they need to uh, get, uh, you know, for the IF for all of the information to get through the IF that we need. You got to remember that a television signal is extremely uh, very wide band. It's actually just under six megahertz wide, or roughly six megahertz wide. Uh, that's at the where it starts coming up on the slopes. The reason for that is, uh, you know, unlike radio, in radio you just got audio. Audio doesn't take up a lot of room. Uh, just a few kilohertz either side of center frequency and that's it. There's not a lot of information. It's easy with audio. Think of it this way. Anybody's messed with, you know, and you all have, you probably got, you know, you've, you've dealt with computers and stuff. You've had, you've probably gotten your collection of discs and stuff. You've probably got some CD, audio CDs. Got lots and lots and lots of songs on that uh, CD. You know, it holds like 720 megabytes. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of songs on there. But if you want to put video on there, you ain't going to get very much video on that CD. You can get some. Yeah, you can. But it's not going to be a lot of video. And if it's high definition video or a lot of information to it, you're almost screwed. You're not going to get a whole lot of time on there. You have to go to a DVD, which holds four and a half gig, or a double, -side, a double sized one that holds twice that much, or even Blu ray, which even goes even more but a DVD nonetheless to hold any decent amount of video. That's because video takes up much room, much more room. There's a lot more information in video as opposed to audio. Audio I have to just deal with some tones, changing tones. Video I have to deal with graphics and it takes a lot more information for those graphics. I got different tones of color, uh, even if it is black and white, it's still shades of gray. So I get different tones of that and a lot of information that has to be entailed on that and everything for that video signal. So that's why they're so broadband because most of that is taken up by video. But it's not just video in that signal. You got the video and you got the audio, but you also got your sync and blanking sig signals in there too because you know, you're picking up a transmitted signal from a, a TV station and they synced out at their end you know how that picture is made up on the screen as it scans the camera scan that picture the video you know the picture the live what action that was going on whatever they were videoing uh, with the camera and it scans it and that means it scans across horizontally and down a certain amount vertically and keeps scanning across. So you have to get those scans in sync. So they're sending out a sync signals for both vertical and horizontal so that the TV is in sync with what they're transmitting. So that when it gets to the TV, those scans come out the way they should be. So that the picture is in sync. You got all these signals coming down that, so you got to have pretty wide bandwidth, and that has you know you know doesn't only just start at the front end, but it has to also go into the IF. Now, 
let's talk about some of the stuff that's in here and how I get the tank circuit. So to do that, we're not going to look at schematic anymore. I did a little bit of draw up here and I'll probably have to back off a little bit and I might have to go up just a little bit. Bear with me. Go up just a little bit. didn't seem to help much. Alright, I think we can get at least most of it in here. Alright, I just took and drew out one of the, just one amplifier section of, on that IF. Drew out the tube 6AU6 and drew out um, the basic components that's in here on it. We have an IF tank circuit here, transformer. We're more or less concerned about the secondary on this. And here's the other IF, and we're mostly concerned about the primary on this side. Now we do have. A decoupling cap here we've got a choke that's in the filament and actually if you follow out some of that filament lead it there is a capacitor on it you got a biasing resistor here standard procedure on um, a lot of IF uh, amplifiers the voltage amplifier they usually use a lot of them use cathode biasing as the primary bias just in case there's literally zero AGC coming in and of course this here goes off to the AGC. We talked about that before. Let's go back to that detector tube, uh, one of the diodes in the 6AL5 detector. So it looks pretty simple. Not a lot of capacitance. I've got a decoupling here, capacitor, to keep stuff off this AGC line. So I don't I'm not feeding into everything. You remember the AGC line goes clear back to the RF tube in the tuner. So I don't want to be feeding this IF frequency back into that RF tube. So we decouple it here. We've got decoupling. Basically all that is is on the screen. Um, just again just like in the tuner an RF amp in there, we want to pull off any signal that's on that screen so it don't get back to the B plus back in the into the power supply. Now, where is the rest of the capacitance? I mean surely this is not enough and this is pretty small capacitor too. Actually really small. I didn't mark the value in there but I believe now well, it's about the same size. Thousand picofarad. But these are not going to work perfectly with these coils and they're not really appearing to be exactly across the coils. Well that's where this little corner comes in. If you look up in the tube manual on that tube and I kind of zero in on it a little bit, there we go. If you look up in the tube manual you're going to see a whole list of different capacitances on the tube. So, I, and I didn't draw them all in here, by any means. Uh, right off the bat, you've got a grid to plate that they list first, and it's 0 .0035 picofarad max. But there is a capacitance between that plate and that grid, internally in the tube. The rest of the capacitances from this grid to this grid, from this grid to this grid, and from this grid to you know G1 to the cathode is all 5.5 .5 picofarads. The ones I didn't draw in is the plate capacitances, but the plate to pretty much any element in here is 5 picofarads, except for the first grid. All these are connected in in, in series. Now right off the bat, if we look at this real quick just as uh, this part here well that part there we connect to the grid on the top side of the coil but it also connects to the cathode 
See? Cathode goes to ground. This capacitor goes to ground. So that's a connection right there. There's my completed circuit. Right there. And in that circuit, I got a thousand picofarad along with 5.5 .5 picofarads. Now when you got capacitors in series, they look work like resistors in parallel. So you know you take the reciprocal of the addition of the reciprocals and that's what you get. You get the total capacitance. So I would take the reciprocal of this plus the reciprocal of this uh, add them together and then take the reciprocal of that and that would give me the total capacitance. In this case it's going to be slightly below the lowest value. It always is. So because that's just you know the math works out. So it would be around about 5 picofarads total capacitance across that coil. Well that coil is sized so that 5 picofarads in parallel with it is perfectly resonant for the particular frequency that it's supposed to be resonating at and tuned to. And I don't remember which one I did. It's either 23, I think it's the 25.3. So anyway that coil with 5 picofarads in parallel will give me if I got it tuned just right, right inductance, see, you know, it's variable. Remember that, you know, I can tune that core in and out, so it's, there's variance. But when I get it tuned just right, in parallel with the 5 picofarad, I get 23 point, or 25.3 megacycles. That, that's the grid side. It's a little more simpler side. A little more simpler to see. Now, the one thing you got to realize this grid here goes to ground. So we want to remember that. Now, and we want to draw in our thousand picofarad here. Okay. Now, on the output side, I need something to go in parallel with this. Well, I've got a few choices, and actually I do. I've got from the plate to the screen grid, right here. Because this goes across here, comes back, and comes back around. So I can take that, and remember I said that the plate to any one of these grids except the control grid is 5 picofarad. 5 picofarads. I'll try saying that several times fast. So there's already five picofarads here in parallel with this. But that ain't all that's here. I also got plate to cathode. Again, this is goes ground to here. They both go to ground, so they're connected. So I can look at that capacitance as well, which again is five picofarads. So I have five picofarads on one, five picofarads in series with this thousand picofarad for the other one. When I do the math on those, well, they're in parallel, so or in series, so they work like resistors in parallel. It's going to come out a little less than 5 picofarads, but it's in parallel with this capacitance here, so it will actually add. So I've got 5 here plus just a little under 5, so say roughly 10 picofarads going across this coil. this coil would be sized so that somewhere with that slug somewhere at some point it will have the right inductance with approximately 10 picofarads to give me and I believe it's 23.1 megacycles and that's what it would do these coils don't have to be all exactly the right winding in fact this is 25.3 and this is 23.1 that automatically should tell you they are different coils but this circuit here will have a, roughly about 10 picofarads, uh, where this circuit will have roughly 5 picofarads, this. And there will be a little bit of some influence of this grid and its capacitance because it's going to ground. So it's actually connected into here, here, and so it's going to have some effect. 
and that would have to be added in too and worked into to, uh, the math. But the point I wanted to make out here is unlike radio, especially at uh, broadcast band, uh, you know, AM, where you have like a 455 kill cycle IF, and those you see nothing, you, you actually see the tank circuit. You'll have, you know, if it's an older radio from the 30s or, um, or uh, early 40s, maybe even to the mid 40s, you'll see, you know, tunable condensers. You know, you'll have a circuit that will look like this. You come cross coil back with a condenser here, you'll have an arrow in it. And of course there'll be another one here doing the same thing. You would see that. And a little later radios, they got rid of this part. Fixed capacitors and they did the same thing as the TV. They'll have a slug that's adjustable. You get near 50s radios you have that. And of course you get into the which I'm going to talk about later uh, in a later video but you get into the silver mica disease as it's called which is a term I do not like but I will go into the physics of exactly what is going on. But in any case you see the capacitance because at 455 I need a fairly large several uh, tens of picofarads of capacitance here, you know, 100 picofarads, you know, 120 maybe, depending on the coils. Here, I only need like 5, 10 picofarads. So, when I'm working with frequencies that are much higher, where I can get down in them real low range picofarads, then I can make use of my tube. It's internal capacitance between the, the different electrodes. And make use of something that sometimes can be a headache in, in some circuits. So that's what they're doing here because we got a higher frequency. But at 455 kilocycles, I'm looking at having something that's 100 picofarads or 120 picofarads or whatever depending on the inductance of the coil. So I hope this kind of explains uh, the answers the questions of not only why we have an IF, we have an IF because as a single frequency you know once I get mixed and everything I get a single frequency all these amplifiers have to be just tuned to that frequency and so they have to they can be designed to be very efficient at amplifying that frequency because they only got to amplify the one basic frequency uh, so I can have several stages, really a lot of gain, uh, and really getting a really strong signal going into my detector. Whereas in tuned RF, where I'm trying to ask that amplifier to cover a wide range of frequencies across the entire, you know, AM band, then it's not always going to be perfect. You know, it's not always going to have top gain across every, on every frequency. It's going to lose some gain at certain frequencies and generally again like I said they generally tried to design it so about mid band that was the best gain and it would only drop off you know some at the ends but it could drop off quite a bit so this way we get a constant signal through we also get much better selectivity uh, this can be made exactly the bandwidth I want it to be whether it's a TV a radio whatever an IF can be made and tuned to the exact bandwidth it's only going to allow in the one frequency that it's looking for and it's only going to allow it and it, there's not going to be a harmonic that's going to be real close to it that can bleed through very easily so you get better selectivity here as opposed to tune RF where you are a lot wider band so you can get some bleed over. If you've got two radio stations that are fairly close you're going to get both of them being amplified. So two reasons for the IF and how it works how the TV is getting its tank circuit from the internal primary from the internal capacitance but it's also making use of other capacitors that absolutely need to be in the circuit and mark my words, when the engineer designed this circuit, he picked 
those thousand picofarads for a reason. I mean, he could have went maybe 500 picofarads or or some other sizes or 1,200 picofarads, but he picked a thousand because of that tube and its internal capacitance and the inductance of that coil. So those were picked for a particular, you know, size so that when everything worked out and the math worked out we had the right size capacitance going across that coil. So anyway, uh, if you have any questions just ask uh, and I'll go over this again and uh, otherwise we'll be moving into probably sync circuits. Uh, we'll deal with first looking at the uh, different oscillators and stuff. We'll probably start with vertical and then um, do horizontal and then we'll work at the exact uh, sync separators and so forth. So until then I want to thank you all for watching. Thank you for your comments and if you like this video give it a big thumbs up and if you're not a subscriber if you just happen across this video uh, please subscribe I do a lot of videos on this and I also I have stuff that I restore and I do videos on it too as um, as I go through it through different things so anyway um, please comment if you have any questions ask and Again, I will, you know, if it's something I can answer pretty quickly, easily in the comment, I will. Otherwise, I will do a follow-up video I, until everybody, you know, don't have any more questions. So, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.